This is Space Time Series 27, Episode 51, for broadcast on the 26th of April, 2024. Coming up on Space Time, how Pluto got its heart. Astronomers are shocked after finding no gamma rays coming from a nearby supernova, and after more than 60 years, the last ever Delta rocket is launched. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. The mystery of how Pluto got a giant heart-shaped feature on its surface has finally been solved, with the cause being attributed to a giant and slow oblique angle impact. The findings reported in the journal Nature Astronomy are based on detailed computer simulations which successfully reproduced the unusual shape. Ever since the cameras of NASA's New Horizons mission discovered the large heart-shaped structure on the surface of the dwarf planet Pluto in 2015, this heart has puzzled scientists because of its unique shape, geological composition and elevation. Scientists use numerical simulations to investigate the origins of Sputnik Planitia, the western teardrop-shaped part of Pluto's heart surface feature. Now, according to their research, Pluto's early history was marked by a cataclysmic impact event which formed Sputnik Planitia, a collision with a planetary body about 700 kilometres in diameter, roughly twice the size of Switzerland from east to west. The team's findings also suggest that the inner structure of Pluto is very different from what was previously assumed, indicating that there is no subsurface ocean. The heart, also known as Tombaugh Reggio, captured the public attention immediately upon its discovery but it also immediately caught the interest of scientists because it's covered in a high albedo material that reflects more light than its surroundings, thereby creating its whiter appearance. However, the heart itself isn't composed of a single element. Sputnik Planitia, that's the western part, covers an area of roughly 1,200 by 2,000 kilometres, which is about equivalent to a quarter of the Australian landmass, or if you prefer, a quarter of Europe or the United States landmass. What's striking, however, is that this region is actually three to four kilometres lower in elevation than most of Pluto's surface. The bright appearance of Sputnik Planitia is due to it being predominantly filled with white nitrogen ice that moves and convex to constantly smooth out the surface. The study's lead author, Harry Ballantyne from the University of Bern, says the nitrogen most likely accumulated fairly quickly after the impact due to its lower altitude. The eastern part of the heart's also covered in a similar but much thinner layer of nitrogen ice, the origin of which is still unclear, but is probably related to Sputnik Planitia. Now, the elongated shape of Sputnik Planitia strongly suggests that this impact wasn't a direct head-on collision, but rather an oblique one, something slammed into it sideways. So the authors used smooth particle hydrodynamic simulation software to digitally recreate such impacts, varying both the composition of Pluto and its impactor, as well as the velocity and angle of the impactor. After a lot of trial and error, the simulations eventually confirmed suspicions about an oblique angle of impact, and they also determined the composition of the impactor. Valentine says Pluto's course so cold, that the rocks remained very hard and didn't melt despite the heat of impact. And thanks to the angle of the impact and the low velocity, the core of the impactor didn't sink into Pluto's core, but remained intact as a sort of splat on the surface. What that means is that somewhere just beneath Sputnik is the remains of the core of another massive body, which Pluto never quite digested. This core strength and relatively low velocity were key to the success of the simulations. Lower strength would have resulted in a very symmetrical leftover surface feature which wouldn't look anything like the teardrop shape observed by New Horizons. The findings shed new light on Pluto's internal structure as well. In fact, a giant impact like this one is much more likely to have occurred very early in Pluto's history. However, this poses a bit of a problem. You see, a giant depression like Sputnik Planitia is expected to slowly move towards the pole of the dwarf planet over time, since it has a mass deficit yet it's paradoxically near the equator. Now, the previous theorised explanation was that Pluto, like several other icy planetary bodies in the outer solar system, must have had a subsurface liquid water ocean. Now, according to this earlier explanation, Pluto's icy crust would be thinner in the Sputnik Planitia region, causing the ocean to bulge there. And since liquid water is denser than ice, you'd end up with a mass surplus that induces migration towards the equator. 
However, our new study offers an alternative perspective. The simulations suggest that all of Pluto's primordial mantle was excavated by the impact. And as the impactor's core material splats onto Pluto's core, it creates a sort of local mass excess that can explain the migration towards the equator without a subsurface ocean, or at most, a very shallow one. This new explanation for the origin of Pluto's heart-shaped feature may one day lead to a better understanding of Pluto's origin. This is space-time. Still to come... Astronomers are surprised that they failed to find gamma rays from a nearby supernova explosion, and history made as the last ever Delta rocket launches from Cape Canaveral. All that and more still to come on Space Time. The explosive death of a star in a nearby supernova event last year provided astrophysicists with an opportunity to test new ideas about how these powerful blasts can accelerate cosmic rays to superluminal speeds. However, surprisingly, astronomers failed to detect any of the high-energy gamma rays expected to be generated by the event. The supernova, named SN2023 IXF, erupted on May the 18th last year in the nearby Pinwheel galaxy Messier 101, some 22 million light years away in the constellation Ursa Major, the Great Bear. A report in the journal Astronomy and Astrophysics described the event as the most luminous nearby supernova since the launch of the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope in 2008. The study's lead author, Guillaume Martini de Venise from the University of Trieste, says astrophysicists had previously estimated that supernovae convert about 10% of their total energy into cosmic ray acceleration. The trouble is this has never actually been directly observed. So the authors were shocked when the new observations of SN2023 IXF showed an energy conversion rate of just 1% within the first few days after the explosion. Now, this doesn't rule out supernovae as cosmic ray factories, but it does mean that scientists need to learn an awful lot more about their production. Trillions upon trillions of cosmic rays collide with the Earth's atmosphere every day. Roughly 90% of cosmic rays are hydrogen nuclei, that is protons, and the remainder are either electrons or the nuclei of heavier elements. Scientists have been investigating cosmic ray origins since the early 1900s, The problem is, however, these particles can't be traced back to their original sources. That's because they're electrically charged, and so cosmic rays change course as they travel to Earth thanks to the many different magnetic fields they encounter along the way. Gamma rays, however, travel directly towards us, and cosmic rays produce gamma rays when they interact with matter in their environment. This is where Fermi comes in. Fermi is the most sensitive gamma ray space telescope in orbit. So, when it doesn't detect an expected signal, scientists need to figure out what's going on. Of course, solving this mystery will build more accurate pictures of cosmic ray origins. Astrophysicists have long suspected supernovae as being the top cosmic ray contributors. Supernova explosions occur when a star at least eight times more massive than our Sun runs out of fuel. As we mentioned earlier this week, stars are basically balancing acts of hydrostatic equilibrium. The outward pressure of the core nuclear fusion is counteracted by the downward pressure of gravity. And once fusion ceases, gravity takes over and the core collapses. In the case of really big stars like this, the star collapses at such an incredible rate, it actually rebounds, propelling a shockwave outwards through the star, creating a supernova. And this shockwave also accelerates particles, creating cosmic rays. And when the cosmic rays collide with other matter, as well as light surrounding the star, they generate gamma rays. Supernova greatly impact a galaxy's interstellar environment. Their blast waves and expanding clouds of debris can persist for more than 50,000 Earth years. Back in 2013, Fermi measurements showed that supernova remnants in our galaxy were accelerating cosmic rays, which then generated gamma ray light when they collided with interstellar matter. Trouble is, these remnants are not producing enough high-energy particles to match scientists' measurements here on Earth. Now, one theory hypothesizes that supernovae are accelerating the most energetic cosmic rays in our galaxy only during the first few days and weeks after the initial explosion. The thing is, supernovae are rare, occurring only a few times a century in a galaxy like the Milky Way. 
And even out to distances of around 32 million light years, supernovae occur on average just once a year. After a month of initial observations, starting when visible light telescopes first saw SN 2023 IXF, Fermi had not detected any gamma rays. Now, failing to detect gamma rays doesn't mean there are no cosmic rays. So scientists will now dissect every aspect of the event, looking deep into underlying hypotheses regarding acceleration mechanisms and environmental conditions in order to convert the absence of gamma rays into an upper limit for cosmic ray production. One hypothesis to try and explain Fermi's failure to detect gamma rays from the supernova event could involve the way the explosion distributed debris, as well as the density of the material surrounding the star. But of course, there are bound to be lots and lots of other options to look through and the team will need to examine all of these before reaching a conclusion. This report from NASA TV. NASA's Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope watches the sky for gamma rays, the highest energy form of light. These detections help scientists learn more about the most powerful events in the cosmos. However, a recent absence of gamma ray detection may have been just as informative. Cosmic rays are small particles like protons and helium nuclei traveling at nearly the speed of light. It takes a lot of energy to accelerate them to that speed, so scientists assume they're driven by powerful events like exploding stars, called supernovae. Because cosmic rays are charged particles, they interact with magnetic fields as they travel. These interactions mean they don't follow a straight line from their sources, and so scientists can't trace where they came from. But when cosmic rays smash into other particles, they produce gamma rays. And gamma rays do travel to us straight from their sources. Fermi has even detected such gamma rays from supernova remnants, which are thousands of years old. If supernovae and their remnants really are a key source of cosmic rays, then calculations tell astronomers how many gamma rays Fermi should detect. But so far, the telescope hasn't seen enough gamma rays from these sources. Scientists had suspected this was because the supernovae were too far away, or observations began too late, well after peak production. In May 2023, Fermi observed the most luminous nearby supernova seen since the mission launched 15 years ago. It captured data from the first few weeks of the explosion, when scientists anticipated the greatest production of cosmic rays. But Fermi didn't see any gamma rays from the explosion. Scientists aren't yet sure what this means for the link between cosmic rays and supernovae. There's still a lot of work left to do. But Fermi's non-detection has added a very important new piece to this high-energy puzzle. This is Space Time. Still to come, after more than 60 years, the last Delta rocket blasts off from Cape Canaveral. And later in the science report... A new study shows that more than a billion people around the world are now living with obesity. All that and more still to come on Space Time. An important piece of history was made this month with the last ever launch of a Delta rocket. After more than 64 years of service, the last ever Delta rocket blasted into orbit from Space Launch Complex 37 at the Cape Canaveral Space Force Base in Florida, carrying a classified spy satellite payload for the National Reconnaissance Office. And it was a spectacular send-off, with three United Launch Alliance Delta IV strapped side-by-side to form a single Delta IV Heavy, the extra power needed to provide the muscle to lift the giant satellite into space. It was an appropriate final send-off. The rocket payload ground systems you know, like in Eastern Range are go for launch. Vehicle internal. Launch sequencer start. Liftoff is currently scheduled for 12.53 p.m. Eastern. FCS launch enabled. FPS arm. OCU's arm. FCS count started. Go for main T-minus engine minus start. T-minus one minute. Rock report range status. Range green. Second stage LH2 secure at flight level. Status check. Go Delta. Go NROL 70. Rope ignition. 10. T-minus 10. Nine, eight, seven, six, five. We have ignition. Two, one. And liftoff of the final United Launch Alliance Delta IV heavy rocket 
carrying NROL 70 for the National Reconnaissance Office and closing Delta's six-decade legacy of excellence in space. The Delta IV Heavy had always been the traditional workhorse, but deploying the National Reconnaissance Office clandestine payloads for over 15 years, significantly contributing to national and allied security. Now, with the retirement of the Delta IV and the Atlas V launch vehicle destined to soon follow, the stage will be set for their replacement, the United Launch Alliance new Vulcan Centaur rocket to take over. That's promising improved affordability and performance. For the record, the Delta rocket achieved some 388 launches during its more than six decades of service. And it's evolved significantly over the years, from an initial 27-metre-tall variant with a mass of 51 tonnes, culminating in the Delta IV Heavy's impressive stature of 72 metres in height and 726 tonnes in mass. The Delta rocket's legacy is rich with pioneering achievements, including the deployment of the first global positioning system satellites, missions to Mars and Mercury, and the launch of groundbreaking scientific probes like the Messenger probe to Eros, the Dawn spacecraft to Vesta and Ceres, and the Genesis mission, which returned comet dust samples to Earth. It also launched the Kepler and Spitzer space telescopes and the first UTELSAT commercial satellite launch. The Delta IV Heavy's final launch came as China launched its latest spy satellite, the Yogang 42A. That was flown aboard a Long March 2D rocket from the Zhaichang Satellite Launch Center in Sichuan Province. This is Space Time. And time now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. A new global analysis has found more than a billion people in the world are now living with obesity. And for kids and teens, the rate of obesity is four times what it was back in 1990. Among adults, the global obesity rate has more than doubled in women and nearly tripled in men. The study, reported in the Lancet Medical Journal, says around one in three Australian adults are also now obese. That's a dramatic increase from around 1 in 7 women and 1 in 8 men back in 1990. The study also found that around 1 in 7 Australian boys and 1 in 6 Aussie girls are now also obese. The countries with the highest rates of obesity on the planet now are the island nations of Tonga and American Samoa for women and American Samoa and Nauru for men, where more than 60% of the adult population is now living with obesity. A new study claims that supplementing your diet with foods that contain resistant starch, things like legumes, chickpeas and lentils, may help with weight loss and insulin sensitivity. The findings, reported in the journal Nature Metabolism, shows that diet supplemented with 40 grams of resistant starch a day over eight weeks helped achieve weight loss of almost three kilograms. The authors say that unlike other forms of starch, which are digested in the small intestine, resistant starch travels to the large intestine, where it's fermented by bacteria. The researchers say this process alters the abundance of a microbe called bifidobacterium adolescence to improve intestinal barrier function and reduce fat absorption. Korean engineers have come up with a new automated flushing toilet device that only works once the lid's down. It's all part of an effort to keep nasty microbes from leaving the bowl and spraying all over the place. The European Congress on Clinical Microbiology and Infectious Diseases has been told that researchers fitted eight hospital toilets with the device and found that when flushed, these toilets sprayed fewer bacteria onto bathroom surfaces compared to traditional toilet systems. While the differences in bacterial numbers on individual surfaces were small, overall the analysis showed that less than half as many bacterial colonies were found on the surfaces surrounding the toilets fitted with the automatic flushing devices compared to toilets not fitted with the devices. A new study claims that most people believe in the existence of angels and that 35% of people claim to have actually had encounters with them. Now, the research was undertaken for a book called Looking for Angels, A Guide to Understanding Connecting with Angels. But as Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics points out, the study raises so many red flags, its true worth is highly questionable. This is a survey from a group called Looking for Angels. So that's the 
to worry to start. They're looking for angels. They're not saying, do they exist? They're looking for them. They did a survey of, and the numbers are confusing to me, but it's, it's a survey of 800 people around the world. Not a lot globally, but yeah, anyway. it's a very small 800 survey. people around the world. The trouble is the three countries represent 75% of the results. What they did was they asked me if they had an encounter or you know, they believe in angels. And those people who didn't believe in angels, they wiped off their survey. Okay, so they didn't ask them any more questions. So what they said is 75% of the people who said they believed in angels believed in angels or had had encounters. So that takes it down a bit. The three biggest countries they looked at that had the biggest results were South Africa, United States and India, all of which have a fairly strong religious base compared to some other countries. Like the, the numbers of people coming out of countries like Australia was two people. Canada was one. UK had a few more than that. But the United States, South Africa and India are known for being highly religious sort of countries, nations. So therefore they got the vast bulk of their survey that they were studying from those three places. So it's an indicator that you're going to get a bit of a bias in your results anyway. So, but okay, so these were people who had already said that they believe in angels. So 75% of their total figure from these highly religious countries said they believe in angels. So that one's a bit dodgy for a start. Then they went on to say, what types of encounters have you had for those people who do believe? And they have things like have vivid or recurring dreams, experience a strong sense to change action, of smelling things, seeing repeated number patterns, seeing an animal or an insect repeatedly, various things that are sort of what they regard anecdotally as strange experiences means they've had an encounter with an angel. The trouble is also with this survey, another issue, they obviously ask people, have you had any of these encounters? And people only were allowed to tick one. Now, normally people would tick more than one if they'd had, you know, various encounters with angels, whatever. For instance, they asked people what was the feelings they'd had associated with these things. And one of them was a, a peaceful, calm feeling. 20% of respondents said they had. But then there was another one, which was a warm hug, which a feeling. And therefore you think, all right, okay, aren't they pretty similar? And, you know, some people were frightened, some people were confused, some people were nothing in particular. But, I mean, you're only allowed to choose one, and that makes 100%. You say, well, no, 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 no. Surely you can choose two or three or whatever, and that therefore you end result will be more than 100%. That's fine. That's the way surveys like that work. But this one doesn't. I think this is a pretty poorly set up survey of a cohort, which is tends to be believers, of this group that they used in their survey. I think it's only about close to 10% had no religious feelings. So you get a biased survey of a biased group with incomplete questions that won't give you a full picture of the feelings that are going on. And it's done from the basis of two people, one of whom is a psychic, self-professed, who has been you know, helping people deal with angels for a long time, and another fellow who's a psychologist, and these two people are promoting this thing. So they're promoters of angels to start with, questionable from a scientific point of view, and they're lo and behold, they're finding people who believe in angels and who have had experiences. So they're going into this survey pre-believing in angels and talking to people who believe in angels about what they believe. So it's really, it's sort of uh, interesting, but the fact that the survey questions and things are so poorly set up, you can't even get a really good picture out of it. So funny enough, it's not a very good study. It's trying to guide you to a foregone conclusion, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. That's Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics. That's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favorite podcast download provider, and from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Spacetime store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Spacetime patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. And if you want more space time, please check out our blog, where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, 
through our Spacetime YouTube channel. And on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 